and students. Thank you so much for attending our 10th Annual Research Symposium and for staying until the very end for our last session. Uh, it's our hope that you have learned a lot from the student presentations, been inspired by our speakers, our keynotes, and that at this particular point you are uh, ready to uh, engage in uh, conducting independent research and you're here because you're wondering, hmm, how do I get started? Uh, let me get some details from these students who we consider to be the experts at this particular point. Uh, if after this presentation you still feel like you have more questions, you may feel free to direct them to me, Anita C. at harker.org. And if it's specifically uh, directed to a student, I'll make sure that one of these students uh, gets your question. So the information session doesn't have to end today, but we certainly hope that this will be pretty comprehensive for you. So without further ado, the first thing that I'd like to do is, an, I'm Anita Chetty, Science Department Chair at the Upper School. Um, I just want to introduce to you what the Science Department, first of all, what our objective really is as far as the research program is concerned, which we started in 2006. The most important thing that we are trying to do is to offer learning and enrichment opportunities for our students. The way that we're doing this is several ways. Of course, we are offering a wonderful academic program within our classrooms, uh, what we consider to be world class. But there are a few other opportunities that you should be aware of. The first one is that when students enter the upper school in grade nine, there is no academic time dedicated to research. And so it's just not possible for us to program it into their daily schedule. So what we offer is something called Open Lab. Open Lab is after school. There is one, uh, one opportunity on Wednesdays during long lunch. But this is all outside normal classroom hours. We have two teachers that are dedicated to mentoring these students and they're able to conduct independent research and so the teachers will take them all the way from concept all the way to a synopsis project if the student remains dedicated to doing that, that opportunity exists. Another one is that we offer internship placement to a certain extent and by that we're constantly searching and trying to find additional internship opportunities for students and helping to place them into those. And by that we mean summer research internship opportunities. The other one is research, the research club, which uh, one of our students um, can talk to you about this afternoon. The research club does everything from inviting researchers who are um, willing to come and speak all the way to mentoring younger students in conducting research, writing papers, etc. The Science Department also offers research expeditions. We have two uh, that we offer, one every year in the summer, at the end of the summer, I should say, primarily for our grade nine and grade 10 students is to Costa Rica. And this is an introduction to field research. We have a professor that actually runs the program for us. She's an adjunct professor with Cal State Monterey Bay. And it's a very, very rich introduction to research, of course, in a, in a beautiful setting. Uh, we also offer another one to this summer, we are going to the Arctic, and Dr. McClintock, who some of you may have heard this morning, he met with all of our Arctic explorers this morning, and they uh, presented their research proposals to him, and he reviewed them, and the students will be conducting research, and you hear more about that when they return, we'll be sharing uh, the data with them. The other thing that we want to talk about is what the science department does as far as competitions is concerned, and I'll turn it over to our research teacher, Mr. Spenner, to do that. Hello, I'm Chris Spenner. I do teach uh, some of the research courses here as well as some physics classes. Um, I'll actually say very little about the competitions themselves. The students will talk about those later, uh, but we do uh, offer a number of uh, support services we're still going to detail on. What I want to highlight mostly, though, is for parents, especially, who are looking for information about these various competitions, um, we have a website, the Research Hub website, which I won't actually go to right now, but I think it's accessible on the parent portal, uh, that has 
dates and deadlines and who to contact and all kinds of logistics information. So, um, so I hope you'll familiarize yourself with that as a resource. Uh, and then, of course, always feel free to ask us questions. And now we'll turn it over to Neil. Hey everyone, I'm Neil Mova, a senior at Harker School, and uh, I want, just want to say that uh, you know it's one thing to talk about the progression and the availability of resources here, but uh, Mr. Chen, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Spender, and Mr. Teddy make it happen. They really do. Uh, I'm living proof of that. And uh, you know it's a four-year experience, and we say that because there's a, there's a progression involved. You don't want to jump in there and uh, you know look for the results right away. You want to look at how you're going to grow over four years. So uh, for me, uh, I did the, exactly what they what, what they've been talking about. Entered in Harker Labs uh, from the beginning uh, in ninth grade, uh, freshman year. I just spent my whatever time I could find extra regular-wise uh, at the lab, and uh, I've had a, I had a great project, entered into synopsis, and uh, you know, got a good, good experience. I mean, it might not have been my best project, but it doesn't matter because that's what, it, really, the, the resource there is experience involved. So, you know, that, that eats, feeds into 10th grade where you go again at it. I, I still didn't have too much time outside of, uh, in my schedule yet, so I still stuck to open lab. And uh, I went ahead and entered another project, an extension project, into Synopsis Science Fair, and uh, it was really obvious immediately how much I would learned from the previous experience. And so I did a lot better that year and got really excited about future research competitions. Now, in 11th grade is when things started to heat up. Um, so this one, uh, this year I actually worked in a more advanced project at Harker Labs. I was able to actually write a, a proposal on a biological research project, had the school approve it and fund me uh, for all my materials and provide guidance through, uh, you know, uh, chemical handling as well as, well as biological consultation. So overall, I was able to do a much more ambitious project in 11th grade because of my experience in the first two years. Uh, with that project, I went to more advanced competitions, uh, Synopsis, again, and JSHS, which is a, it's, it's a speaking competition that I'll get into in more detail later. Uh, finally, 12th grade is when I sort of graduated from the school a little, a little bit. Uh, I went to Stanford University and conducted research there with Dr. Jill Helms, and that was, again, an amazing experience. Lots of hard hours put into the lab, uh, but it really paid off, and uh, you know, part of that was also because uh, you know, coming back to school, the lab research didn't end. You still had to look through all the data you collected, analyze it, and write a paper out of it. And we'll talk about writing papers again uh, later on, but uh, uh, Ms. Chetty, Mr. Spanner, and a lot of the other Parker faculty actually involved directly in, in helping us edit papers, write papers, and uh, get a great result. As you know, we are the record uh, holding school for this year's Intel Science Fair, and I think that's gonna continue in the future. All right, I'm turning it over to uh, Ms. Chetty again. Thank you, Neil. Uh, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit about the research expeditions because sometimes I will get parents who will uh, contact me after the, the trip has closed and they didn't know anything about it. So it's really important to me that you are aware that we've been running research expeditions now since 2004, uh, very successfully uh, with, with no incident and that they are very, very rich experiences. So when you think about a trip, um, I, you know, I, I want you to know they're fun, but they are very academically focused, research focused. The, this is our students working with the professor, and this is a great example, this particular image, of how the students go out in the field, they collect something as simple as uh, all of the seashells that they can find. And she is a great statistician. She actually takes all of those seashells and gets the students to do, she, she shows a bimodal distribution of the, the diversity of those particular species. It's a very simple illustration, but it teaches the students very, very quickly how to do statistics, how to collect data. And then they go on and they do their own independent research project. We had two poster sessions that you may have seen that were done in Costa Rica, and one of them actually won second prize at Synopsis. So although it's a, it's a fairly short um, trip, only two weeks, uh, there's enough that they do. And this is a great introduction for freshmen as well as for sophomores. Uh, we also offer, as I said, the Arctic ex Expedition, which is for older students, but once again, with a clear research focus. These are not uh, just uh, fun, leisurely journeys that we go on. They're pretty intense. Uh, we write course material, and as I was mention mentioning, we work with Dr. Uh, McClintock today uh, in order to put those projects together. And you'll be hearing more about them. And I'll turn it back to Mr. Spenner to talk about our research classes and our research program. So we offer two research classes. The first is uh, research methods. Um, it is a one-year class. It's available to anybody after their freshman year. So they just have to have completed physics to take it. Uh, the first semester is really kind of a more standard academic style class. 
where we go over how to pick a project, how to read papers, how to write technical papers, uh, how to do quantitative analysis, uh, a lot of kind of basic common research skills. Uh, and we end the semester with a proposal. And then uh, once the proposal is approved, the students do the project in the second semester. Um, the advanced research class is more of an independent study. It's a one semester class, but students can take it repeatedly. Uh, I've actually had a student take it for six semesters in their high school career. Um, so that one is open to anybody who has either finished the research methods class uh, or who has already had a mentored project somewhere. Um, and the, the one thing I'll add about that is just kind of the, the paradigm of the class is that it's, it's cumulative learning. So it's, it's not like a physics class where I start the whole curriculum from scratch each year. I really I have a library of projects and resources that I've built up over time, and it's always improving. And so we use those every year, kind of the way real science works, right? We keep building off what previous years have done. So that's the goal of that class. And who's next? Neil, you're up here. So a bit more detail about actually working in Harker Labs. So uh, as I mentioned, I worked in open lab for ninth and 10th grade and then went to the advanced research class in, uh, in 11th grade, both semesters. So uh, again, the, the labs are open to almost anyone with a project, an idea, and uh, a drive to work, basically. So you can come in after school and uh, take whatever time you can to, well, talk to the teachers, talk to their students, and come up with a nice project. Now, uh, the resources available, we, we talk about research classes, of course, so I think that if you're not so sure what you want to do yet, uh, and you want a little bit of direction, maybe this is the place for you. You can take one of the research classes, you'll have a lot of exposure to a lot of things really quickly, and your peers will, again, have the same goals as you, so you can talk to them about that and uh, get moving pretty quickly. Now, if you already have an idea in mind, and you think you're going to do pretty well with that idea, or you think you can uh, go ahead and execute on that right away, you can. You can go to Open Lab, and we'll have all the resources available to, uh, to support you on that. So uh, again, that's what I did for the first three years of my high school career, and I would say it's vital. People want to go from zero to 100 really quickly, but you can't. You can't go to a Stanford lab or you can't go to a university lab right away out of high school, right out of the gate. It takes time. You want to develop research methods and the skills in a, in, a, in a smaller setting first. And so our lab does provide that opportunity, and it does it great, uh, a great job of that. So well, I just wanted to uh, define what we mean by a, uh, a research internship, at least how does Harker define that? So there are an awful lot of programs available over the summer, uh, both uh, in the Bay Area, but uh, all across the country. And I think it's really important for the student to determine what do they want to get out of the summer? What is it that they really, really want to uh, develop, to gain, et cetera? So if your uh, idea is to just simply learn about some subject matter in a lot more detail, to have a college experience, to maybe experience what it's like to live in a dorm, uh, to be other, with other students from across the country, then you could enroll in an academic program. So when you go searching for summer programs, just look and make sure that if you're looking for an internship where you're doing actual research with a professor and your goal is to generate data and be able to analyze it, be careful about looking for that versus looking for an academic program. So I'm not saying one is better than the other. You need to make a decision on what are you looking for? How do you wish to spend your summer? Uh, because certainly there's lots of, there's a huge diversity of what's available out there. There is also something called a clinical internship. So I wanted to make sure I had defined everything for you. So you've got now the academic program. You understand now what I mean by a research internship, which is where you're mentored with a professor. You're collecting data, similar to what many of these students engaged in after their junior year, possibly. We also have something called a clinical internship. So what do I mean by that? A few years ago, I worked with Kaiser San Jose and I developed a program for Harker students where they get to uh, spend four to six weeks at the Kaiser facility. It's not quite like job shadowing. There are certainly physicians who are involved in the program, but the students go from clinic to clinic. They get lectures, uh, they discuss uh, various cases, it, they get to observe uh, operations, possibly the birth uh, of a baby. 
Um, there's a lot that they learn in, in, in the four to six weeks. A lot, not only in terms of actual content, but what is it like to be a doctor uh, you know, on a daily basis? What, are, what is the, the rigor involved? What is the job actually like? Uh, the Kaiser uh, Clinical Internship is only available to students who have finished their junior year uh, for several reasons, one being the age requirement, but two, we want them to have, have a strong biology background before they actually start this. So this is something for those of you who are younger and you're really thinking maybe that's uh, an occupation I'd like to pursue, that's something you can work towards. And uh, for those of you who are in your junior year right now, this is something that I am currently working on with the doctors, and I'll be posting that shortly on the announcements page. So more to come on that. And I think that I have uh, defined this a little bit, but I wanted to define it one more time. What do I mean by a summer research internship? Uh, this is something that is somewhere between five and 10 weeks over the summer. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit longer than that, uh, but what you want is you want to have a good amount of time to not only come up with a research project, but to also generate adequate amounts of data so that you can do uh, a, an appropriate analysis on it. Um, you, uh, you may find that you, are, you, you could be part of a program, so this is getting back to what I said, when you're doing the research about what program am I going to do, look and see if they in fact do have uh, a program that does enable you to, and the students will give you examples of some of these in a minute, but look carefully at, is this just where I'm, am I just going to be attending lectures every day, or am I actually going to be partnered uh, uh, with, with a mentor? Am I actually going to be working in a lab? Uh, it could involve you living um, at that location. So for example, we have a program that we've set up at the University of Akron in Akron, Ohio. This is a polymer research lab, and this is one that we offer actually to our grade 10 students who have finished chemistry. They're nominated by their chemistry teachers. Now, it, this is an unusual one because this is one that we've developed exclusively with this particular lab. And it's one we've had running for three years now, very successfully. It's special because our students actually don't live on campus. They live in a residential hotel. And the parents are required to chaperone for one week at a time. So it's a little different. If you're interested in this one and you are currently a sophomore, uh, we are working on this one and we'll be announcing this one shortly. But it is a little different just because we don't want the students to live on campus. And it's worked very successfully. Um, I think that what you want to remember is when I say research internship, please remember what our objective is as a science department. Anything that we're offering, our objective is that you will learn and be enriched by it. Our goal is not for you to write a Siemens or Intel paper at the end. That is not our goal, and it may not happen. We've had students who have, for example, gone on the Akron trip. They had a fantastic experience, uh, but they were not able to come up with a paper. They didn't collect enough data, because as Mr. Spenner says, as Neil has also said, science is like that. You're, you know, it's not like you begin and you end finish. It's not like that. It's an ongoing um, activity, a journey. All right. So let's let Andrew tell you about finding a research internship. How do you do that on your own? Yes, I think uh, a lot of what Ms. Chetty said has covered this very comprehensively, but uh, I guess there are a few main options that you guys can take if you want to apply for a summer research internship, like an internship where you actually work in a lab with a professor. So the first way is to apply for a structured research program, and that is like what Ms. Chetty mentioned, maybe like six to 10 weeks of the summer, where you're with a group of high school students and you have to apply through like teacher recommendations, transcripts, and test scores. So for that, you have to definitely have to be very disciplined, and I think the benefit of such a program is like if you're not very like experienced with research, there's like a very good support system set up for you, and um, it's kind of meant to introduce high school students without much of a past research background into working and doing high, high level and rigorous research. So for that, it's definitely really important to plan ahead. All the application deadline dates are different. Some are very early, so 
the essays have to start working on them. Um, teacher recommendations have to start early. So it definitely is a good idea to keep track of a spreadsheet. And as Mr. Spenner mentioned with the um, research hub, there's a list of maybe like 20 something or so research programs that you guys can look into. And then the, um, I guess next slide. Yeah, the other aspect is contacting professors and then Rohith will be talking more about this like right after me, so I won't go too into detail. And for this, it's definitely, um, I, I experienced both. Um, I did working with a professor that I contacted on my own in like ninth to 10th grade. And then in the summer after 11th grade, I applied for a research program. And I feel with these professors, um, you definitely have a lot more freedom in kind of choosing what you want to pursue because the labs you like contact and the labs you choose can really closely match your interests. But for this, you have to probably be more independent and you don't really know a lot of the times what you're getting yourself into and you might not have as much support because these professors and um, mentors are very busy. All right, um, so as Andrew said, um, well, I'll talk about how to contact a professor. Um, so the first thing I'd like to just, um, so me, myself, and I know this is a problem, that, a concern that a lot of people might have, um, you might not have a lot of experience prior to, say, your first internship, and you don't need to. Um, because not, it's not just about, when you contact professors, your success rate is not just about you having a lot of experience or about your prior skill set necessarily. It's also about you just showing a genuine interest and you making yourself to be a person that that professor would want to work with. So when we, so uh, you, so when you come, when it comes to contacting a professor, the biggest thing is that yes, it's good to submit a resume, and it's a, definitely a big plus if you have a lot of prior experience. But the, I'd say the most important thing in contacting a professor and making sure that that professor responds to you and perhaps and that you might be able to work with him over the summer is one to do your homework and to look at what that professor is interested in to make sure that if you were to work with that professor, it's some, his work is something that you'd genuinely be interested in. And as a result of your doing your due diligence, you'll be able to write a meaningful letter uh, and a very personal letter to that professor explaining why uh, his uh, working in his lab will meet your interests and what you can contribute regardless of your prior, prior experience. And so as far as, uh, some, as, far as tips, um, that being said, you can write the most compelling letter and odds are you might not get a response. So as far as contacting professors, um, as a high schooler, you probably aren't gonna be working with the department chair of a university. So it's often good to just be, have reasonable expectations. And at a lot of these top universities, like especially around the Bay Area, assistant professors, associate professors are exceptionally talented people who have more than enough experience to give you a meaningful project. And so when you start thinking about, uh, oops, sorry. When you start thinking about who to contact and who you wanna work with, don't just take a sort of a very black and white approach and think of, and, and try to work with the, the star professor at say Stanford. Instead, think about what interests you and really look into what the, prof what the substance of what the person you wanna contact is actually doing and, and that will make your experience better and it'll also make your success rate in contacting these professors better. Uh, and then finally, uh, these, these spots fill up fast over the summer, um, so start early and start even as early as January, uh, February, you wanna make sure that it's, it'll be both low stress for you and you'll have a higher success rate. So with that, um, I'll let Steven talk about the actual internship experience once you contact professors. Okay, so I guess for when you're, there's a strong difference between, I guess, what you do in school and your actual time at an internship. And that means a lot of adaptation is necessary. So the way that you should approach a research internship is to really find out what your strengths are and focus on them because that will allow you to be much more successful in this new environment. <coughs> so this involves, I guess, kind of bringing on finding a new comfort zone or a new, I guess, niche to belong in because you're going to be at an internship for a reasonable, a reasonable amount of time. It's not going to be this one week kind of thing that you would stroll into and then come out of. 
So you really want to find a sort of groove to be in in order to kind of find like the laboratory as maybe your new home for the summer. And so this also means kind of interacting with other professors and making sure that you aren't uncomfortable interacting with them because they provide pretty much all the guidance you'll have in the laboratory and will be the most useful mentors you can have over the summer. Also, you should try to find a balance between being professional or being yourself because obviously when you're conducting yourself in the laboratory, you have to maintain a professional composure and make sure that people can take you seriously in the laboratory. But at the same time, that also doesn't mean to kind of change who you are. You still wanna maintain your curiosity and what you're interested in, but at the same time, make sure that you come across as somebody who's serious and can work in this new environment and that people can actually trust you to execute experiments and find meaningful data. So overall, the research internship is really, I guess, a new experience for everyone. And you really have to find a new way to approach things and conduct yourself in a way that makes you still yourself, but at the same time, uh, much more professional. So additionally, this also means that um, you have to communicate a lot with your mentors. So the first thing that you should establish with your mentor when you first go into your internship is to clarify your expectations and your mentor's expectations. So for example, if a lot of students are interested in the Intel and Siemens competition, this means establishing at the very start of the internship your intentions on what you do with the data that you might find in the lab and whether you'll submit this with competitions because many mentors may be willing to publish this work and there are very, I guess, strict lines between what can be presented and what cannot be. So communication is essential if you wanna make your internship experience especially meaningful. Also, uh, make sure that you make the most of all the members. Not only do you have your primary mentor and your principal investigator, but there's also a lot of other people around that are just part of the lab that can obviously help you along the way. So this also means just don't be afraid to ask for help because the only way you can really get out of a tight spot is if you Make sure you use all your resources necessary and you allow your mentors to help you along the way. And finally, I guess one of the most important things is simply to be or organized and detailed. So this involves maybe keeping a record of all the methods and results you've kind of collected. Um, also create a lab book to make sure that you record any sort of details or experiments. And make sure you have a system down where you might have like an article system or some other way to make sure that everything is in place. So with that, I'll be turning it over to Sadaka who will kind of expand upon this further. So, um, and a research internship may not be exactly what you expect, and so working with a mentor is really not as similar as working with a teacher, especially at Harker, where we have a lot of extra help sessions. And so like Andrew mentioned, you really have to be a lot more independent and proactive in terms of directing where you want your internship to go and solving problems when you encounter them. Um, like Steven said, it's really important to know everyone in your lab because um, they're really great networking opportunities, and this is really the start of your professional experience. Like, these are contacts that you may call upon later and say, remember when we spent that time in the summer together? And so you really want to make sure you maintain a good personality and a good working relationship with all the people in your lab. And so um, the research internship experience can really help with your college applications in a way that you, don't, you may not realize. And so I'm a junior, and I'm just entering the process. And what I've found is that a lot of what the college counselors want and a lot of the college application process is about introspection and figuring out what your priorities are. And I think that research internship experiences can really help you build that and learn that about yourself because as you encounter failures and as you try different methods and you hit different ro roadblocks, you really learn about how you handle failure, what you like to do, what you don't like to do, and stuff like that. And so that's really helpful for when you get to the college application process in senior year. And so um, what to do when things go wrong. And so research internships, like I said, are not very much like the classroom in that you may encounter a mistake that really no one knows how to handle. 
And so you have to be very excited and driven, and you have to understand that you can revise your project as you're going along if the results don't match what you want them to be. And so you have to be open-minded, and you have to really be proactive and driven, and you have to know a lot about the field that you're researching in. So if you do end up submitting your research to Intel or Siemens, you'll be required to write a technical paper, most of which are 18 to 20 pages long. So the most important thing in writing this paper is to start early, ideally over the summer while you're still working at your lab. Um, the Siemens deadline is about a month once we come back from school, which leaves you with very little time to work on the paper at that time. In addition, a lot of the Harker faculty is willing to revise multiple drafts of your paper, so it's really upon you to start early and then take the initiative to go talk to your teachers and get your paper reviewed. Um, you can start especially the background research over the summer as soon as you get your project and have talked to your mentor about your intention to submit to the competition. And it's very important to take very detailed notes during your internship so that if you have to work on your Intel paper later, you can still have all your lab data and all your procedures and methods because you do not want to be caught having to fabricate data at the very last minute. Um, use your mentors and the Harker faculty readers is one of the best um, advantages of our research program is the um, opportunity to use any Harker faculty member to read your paper. In addition, most mentors are willing to read a draft or two of your paper if you give them sufficient time. It's also important to learn LaTeX. It's a typesetting software which makes it a lot easier to incorporate images and format your paper well. Um, you can go out of order while writing your paper if you'd like to work on the methods section before you start the introduction. Whatever you think is most comfortable as long as you start working on it early. And it's really important to draw the line between what you have contributed to the project and what your mentor has done, just to make the clarification. And it's very, very important to say why your, re why your research is important and why this is worthy of recognition in a competition. And convey the significance and the goals of your research project to the entire community. Right, so when you're giving a speech or an oral presentation, this usually takes place uh, when you're presenting your project to judges uh, during competitions. The first thing you should do is consider your audience. Now, sometimes they won't be judges, and sometimes the judges will be different in some competitions. What I mean is some competitions will have people who are well-renowned or well, they're well-versed in your topic. And so if you're presenting at like synopsis or something, people will generally know what you're talking about. Although if you're doing something very specific, you still might want to explain like the very, very technical jargon or something. However, if you're like at a conference with like people who are specifically within your field of research, then you might be able to be more lenient with the explanations because they're probably even better well-versed. Um, another thing to note is if you're presenting to uh, just like a general audience, you will want to keep things as simple as possible, but still conveying the same kind of message. And so what you should really do is you should focus on trying to determine which part of your material is like very, very technical, and which part helps to give people a better understanding of what you're talking about. And one thing you should always do, though, is try to focus your results and highlights with the figures. And this really helps because uh, with images and like, like graphs, it's very easy to convey messages that would be otherwise harder to depict. Um, it's very it's very easy to be drawn to these figures, so it's also a good way to not make your poster look really boring with a lot of text and stuff. And again, on poster presentations, it's mostly going to be as if you're on a one-on-one -on -one talk. And so what I mean by this is your poster should be like a tool. It should not be like what you should be presenting. You should be the one presenting yourself because the real person who did the project is you. You know more than you can like put on the poster. And the poster is really a way to help you um, like present stuff, but also 
to keep stuff in the back of uh, the judges or whoever's listening to you. You can keep it in the back of their mind. You can refer to stuff again if you need to. And it just helps you uh, have like something to refer to. And you can adjust the talk by perhaps like some parts of the poster might be more important, some might be less important because uh, some judges might like to jump around and you kind of have to be able to deal with that flow because they might be more interested in other areas of your research than um, like another person who's like listening to your talk. And for communicating, you really want to um, be able to know every inch of your project because somebody might be interested in like some information that really affects your project, but not something that you really research. So it's like some background information. This is really important sometimes because it's able to help you build credibility. And so uh, if, you, if you seem to know like everything about your project, then you'll seem more confident. And you need to focus on relevance and application. And so this is, this is kind of like, it's, it's like what Roshni was talking about before, like who cares and like what's, what's really important about your project. This is one of the main important things about science. You, you really need to be able to like tell people why this is significant because otherwise you're not really going to like have research that's as meaningful. It should have some kind of impact and you should find some kind of way to um, like make, make people drawn to it. And one way I found is uh, you should try to orient your project as a kind of a story because if you're trying to tell people a story, it's very easy to get them drawn in and very interested in the topic even though they might not have a lot of background information. And finally, you should practice. Practice is really good in helping you reinforce your own knowledge and also from personal experience, the more you practice, it's, it's as if you're giving a presentation and just through practice, you're able to uh, improve the skills that you will use later in presentations. Like if you, if you just like go into every presentation without practicing, you're not really giving yourself a lot of opportunities to talk through. And not only does that give you less of a informative presentation, it makes it so that you're not as prepared in the future if you had to present a completely different topic. Like these are skills that will transfer throughout your like career as a scientist, researcher, and a presenter in anything. Like if you're just giving a public speech, then it's also a very useful tool to practice beforehand. And I'll give it over to Mr. Spenner to talk more about the synopsis. So we will talk about a few of the competitions now. Uh, I facilitate the synopsis competition, which is the county science fair. Uh, students who do well in that can go on to the state science fair or the Intel International Science Fair. Um, I view it really as a chance for the students to uh, kind of get out and share their work with other people. Um, it's, uh, to, to me, a symposium, actually. Today was the best approximation of, of the real world of science, right? You, you get to share your work. You're not worried about being judged. Synopsis is similar to that. You are judged. There are awards. That's nice. You can progress. Uh, it gives students kind of a, a, a very specific goal to shoot for. Um, so it's a nice way to get going and research. Um, it does require sponsorship. Uh, usually, uh, it's a teacher who sponsors. There are a few ways around that. Um, but you need to start your project early and get it approved. So the one thing, if you're planning to do a synopsis project in the upper school, uh, you need to really have your project either done or fully planned out by October, I would say, uh, even though the competition is in March, just because we have so many students who do it and only so many teachers who can sponsor. Um, that's my major advice. If you want more details on Synopsys, again, I would refer you to the Research Hub website uh, on the parent portal. So the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair is one of the many science fairs you can qualify to through Synopsys. And it's one of the best because you get to spend a week at a science competition and it's held at different places around the country every year. And what's best about it is that there you're judged by over like 15 judges, all of whom have terminal degrees and at least seven years of professional experience in their field. 
So you really get to meet um, professors and scientists and mathematicians who have the most experience and are the most qualified to talk to you about your project and are also incredibly excited to learn about what you've done. And you get to meet people from around the world, over 70 countries participate, who have done the most exceptional science research in their country. So this is a really great opportunity. Um, yeah. Another more local but also international opportunity that is not talked about a lot but is still really great offered through Harker is the US Invitational Young Physicist Tournament. So this is kind of a different format of science competition. And the way this works is that every year there are four research problems that are assigned. And every school who participates in this competition, including Harker, has an entire year to work in teams to solve these four problems. And at the end of the year, they gather in some school or college and they present their results, but rather than presenting to judges directly, they present in a debate style format where one team will present the solution to their problem through their research that's both experimental physics research and theoretical physics research, and the other team will oppose it and poke holes in their problem in a manner similar to defending a PhD thesis, which is a really interesting way because everyone is doing original research on these same problems, and so you really get to test out what kinds of ideas are the most successful and the least successful. And at Harker, we sponsor this, and so starting around now, in fact, we're starting to have meetings, and we work and we have groups of, um, we have four groups that each work on an individual research project, and the students who work the hardest get to lead projects at this competition and present on the panel that debates and argues for and against. Uh, so another science competition that's very different from Siemens and Intel is Google Science Fair because it has a very modularized process of submission and so they're very short segments unlike the long Siemens submission. And so Google Science Fair is really looking for a practical project or at least a project that has a huge translational impact. And so the judges on the panel for Google Science Fair are often judges with a great scientific background, but they've applied their scientific knowledge in different ways. For example, some people are volunteering in Africa, or some people are work for Virgin Galactic and trains, train astronauts to go into space. And so as you can tell, you will receive a very diverse judging panel, and so Google Science Fair is a great opportunity to showcase a project that may not be as technical, or it may not be as so rigorous, or really anything very diverse, but it, it can be a project that you've invented, an invention. It's really a broad range of topics that are accepted. So once, so the process of submission, the textual submission, actually takes you all the way to the global finals if you qualify. And so at the global finals, you then give an oral presentation with a Q&A session. And so all of the tips about oral presentations definitely apply. But Google Science Fair in particular, like I said, you have to be understandable to many scientific backgrounds. And the questions they ask are very probing and different because they're looking for a method that can really be falsified or they're looking for people who have gone through the scientific process multiple times, hit roadblocks, come back up, redesign their methods. And finally, um, the Global Finals is a really fun place to go because they have really cool activities. For example, um, when I went there, we had a tour of Google and they let us actually go in the self-driving cars. And so the, Google's, the Google Global Finals are really about networking, meeting young scientists from around the world, as well as these amazing people who have taken their scientific knowledge to different underprivileged places. And really the contacts you make there can last a lifetime because I'm still in touch with everyone I met at Google Science Fair. Okay, so the Siemens competition is another one of the opportunities that you have to present your research. So Siemens is one of two um, competitions where you have to write a scientific paper and you will submit this paper. And so it's available to technically all students in high school, um, but seniors must, seniors have the opportunity to do a solo project, whereas all underclassmen need to do it in at least a group of two. So the groups are either two or three. Um, and one thing to note is that the time is really short. Like we've previously said, uh, there's not much time after school starts to really work on this paper. Um, and so it's, it's really good if you have a, an opportunity to get a head start on your 
paper before school starts. And this is also really good in some cases because you'll still be able to use your summertime to stay in contact with your mentor. Um, when school starts, it's, it's, it gets very difficult to juggle like um, research, uh, writing your paper, and then like schoolwork at the same time. Like sometimes your research not, might not be completed by the end of the summer, and if you really want to get um, like a paper, then you're going to have to also spend time finishing it up during the school year. And so one really good opportunity is the advanced research class, uh, like we said before. There's, um, there's a lot of learning done in advanced research, and it's like a very good opportunity to not only have time during the school day to work on your uh, paper, but it's also a very good experience. I was in advanced research for a few semesters, and it's always very refreshing because it's not like a stagnant, it's not like a stagnant course. It's very different every year, um, or it's like a very different experience. And one thing to know is you have to really be able to keep up with the deadlines. Um, one, there's like a few procedures that you have to go through, um, but really just you have to be able to pace yourself throughout the paper. Like you want to uh, be able to have revisions and like you really want to have um, people able to read your paper and preferably like your mentors are really good for this because um, they're very well versed in the subject obviously and they're able to help you clarify things that might be um, wrong or if, you, if you're having like a bit of a problem trying to explain it, you could just ask them um, for like suggestions or how it would be easier to like talk about something. And also you should be able to um, print your paper in advance because sometimes you may need to like send in uh, hard copies or it might be good to just make sure that there's no problems with the documents. Yeah, okay. So for the people who are like interested in into STS, you can probably like probably be better for you to read about the details online yourself, but I guess I'll just talk about three main tips. First, um, it's a pretty big endeavor. It's 20 pages, so you definitely need the content to fill that. So you have to know what you're getting yourself into and realize that over the summer, you're probably going to have to commit like your whole summer to go into the lab every day in order to do this. And then the second main thing is um, it's a pretty big process. It's like a college application. You need to write a lot of essays too. So definitely leave out enough time in your first semester of your senior year, maybe even block out a free period. And then third, I think the biggest tip for me is that like, at least what I, I never really thought about Intel at all when I was doing my internship, and I don't think you guys should either because that might limit yourself. Just focus on doing research, focus on doing what you're excited about, and then when competition time comes, you'll have like all the results and you'll understand your project so well that it'll be pretty easy. Okay, we're gonna wrap up the competitions now. Uh, so the last one is JSHS, that stands for Junior Science and Humanities Symposium. Now, contrary to what the title says, there are no humanities, so no poetry here. But uh, it is all about presentation. So the idea is that, it, like all we talked about in terms of communication, that happens every, at every level of JSHS. You submit a technical paper, yes, uh, that's five to 20 pages, of course, but um, the, real, the real judging happens actually live. So you end up going, we have multiple rounds. We start with the Harker internal round, then we go to a regional round, then a, then a larger regional round, and finally the national finals. So lots and lots of steps, and you had to be really comfortable with your research to do well at JSHS. I mean, if you don't know something, it'll come out on the panel, uh, or it'll come out on stage, and you don't want that. So the biggest advice for JSHS is to really de dive into your research, delve into every nook and cranny, and be able to bring any, any, all the knowledge you have to bear. Uh, you want to have, you want to use your time effectively. So the timing is works like this: you uh, you have 12 minutes to talk uh, about your project. PowerPoint presentations are very common, and then a six-minute Q&A. Now the six-minute Q&A is where they really get you. Uh, they have again expert judges from all all different fields, all different walks of life. And you had to answer every single question on point. You do not want to uh, show any sort of uh, uh, slip ups or anything like that. You want to be really well versed. You want to show them that you're an expert, not just in your field, but in tangentially related fields as well. So uh, this is kind of a mix of the previous competitions. And uh, the biggest thing it rewards is a, a person who's really passionate about their work. So I also wanted to echo what Andrew was saying about not going to a research uh, internship or working to, to the end goal of a competition. That's not the right way to do it. And in fact, if you do that, you'll find out that your, your results are going to be neutered for it. Um, working towards a goal like that, while uh, it might seem like you, you're attracted to the glamour, uh, you won't end up doing, you won't end up living through the research. And you have to be really passionate. You have to live through your research. You have to uh, believe in it, really. You don't, you don't want it to be a means to an end. So with that, I'm, we're going to close on the competitions.
as far all of you have heard about the student presentations and the competitions that are a possibility of doing research at uh, any point in high school, I am here to give you a parent's perspective and I've been a hardcore parent for eight plus years. From all my observations, I think the best strategy that has worked for us is to put the child in the driver's seat and let them navigate the process. And uh, even from early on, as early as middle school, I've seen that there are multiple elective classes that Harkar offers, and these classes are a very good opportunity for the child to explore early on as to what their interests are. Um, from my child's perspective, she has taken a lot of computer science classes while she was in middle school, and that kind of helped develop her interest in that area. And uh, coming into high school, uh, there are multiple opportunities, and the Harker program is a really solid research program where there are multiple points in the year where Ms. Chetty and the research department, they kind of get to the kids through assemblies and remind them about the deadlines and uh, other things that have to be done to go into the competition. But that said, I would like to insist that the end result of any work is not the competitions, it's not the prizes to be won, but it's for the child to help develop their passion. And uh, this high school is the area or is the point of time in their life when they get to understand what their pa where their passion lies. As a parent, being on the sidelines and helping support what they want to do and drive and being there when there is a failure to talk to them and to be supportive and to try some other things for which would be more fun or more for their capability would be something that every parent needs to think about. And uh, I would also like to highlight it's all about the journey through all these experiences that they learn. And this is only the beginning of their passion and whatever they find here is for them to keep for a lifetime. So gearing things towards competitions or prizes may not <coughs> help them find their true passion, which they would have to continue in college and beyond. So uh, when we look at summer as a family, we look at it as a, as a time of the year when you take off from school and have fun. And when I say fun, both my kids related to research and the opportunities that they had to explore science research and the people that they got to meet during the way and the lessons that they have learned. But this may not be true for every child or parent. I would encourage you to explore a lot of other opportunities that are out there if research is not for you. And um, I'm, college is not a, the end result of all the research competitions. And there is no checklist that needs to be checked off for your child to get into a good college. I would highly recommend you to be on the sidelines and you know, encourage whatever their passion is. And there are multiple opportunities at Harker. Research is one of them, and definitely it's a very rewarding program if your child has a vested interest in it. And Miss um, Jetty and the Harker teachers in the science department are very supportive of them once they get into the program. And they do have a lot of reminders all across the program as to what needs to be done. So as a parent, a few gentle reminders here and there at home and uh, being supportive of them and helping them maneuver the high school as, a, as an experience where they would find their passion, which is for them to keep for a lifetime. And uh, it's not just to get into a college and to leave your um, experiences behind and to explore something different. So I look at it as a beginning point for your child to find your passion here and take it into the outside world to explore it further. And uh, Harker offers a great platform to do all these uh, science research competitions. And if it's for your child, definitely uh, they are very supportive and they will give you the right platform for your child with, minimal, with uh, very minimal intervention from the parents. Um, that being said, I would say that put them in the driver's seat and watch them grow. It's a fun experience and uh, trust them. It will all work out in the end. All I can say is it's not often that you get, what, what have we got here? Eight or 10 future scientists and leaders of tomorrow and you saw so many others throughout the day and there's so many sitting amongst you. Being at Harker is truly an inspiring 
um, experience for teachers, parents, and students alike. We are very, very fortunate. I want to thank these students for their dedication to scientific research um, and, their, and congratulate them on their success. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise this afternoon. And Ms. Melody, that was straight from your heart. Thank you so much. I know there's a tremendous amount of uh, confusion and anxiety uh, amongst our uh, middle school parents, and I hope those of you in the audience have had um, some of that dispelled this afternoon. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Spenner, uh, my sidekick partner in crime, uh, for all the efforts um, that he puts and all the enthusiasm and joy that he brings uh, to the program. Um, I, I do believe that after speaking uh, uh, on the stage here for over an hour that we would have answered all of your questions, um, but we would be willing to take uh, one or two. Um, we're not using Slido, uh, and that once again, if there's any that, that have not been answered, that you can certainly email me. So we can take one or two questions at this time. Come on up. I think we'll use the, unless you can speak loudly, we can certainly use the portable mic. How do you think of a good idea and how do you know it's true? Who would like to take that question? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I think that a lot of it is less about People, you think that when people present projects that they sat down one day, they decided that they were going to do a research project, and the next day they woke up and they had their whole project. That's really not how the research process works. A lot of it works through trial and error, through coming up with a bunch of ideas, most of them not working out, and finally settling on one that does work out, or starting on an idea that's really not going to work out for you, and then realizing along the way what you should be working on. I think a lot of the best research is directed based on your interests and your research because you find, you think that there's been so much science done because we're already in the 21st century, but as you investigate fields in science that you're very interested in, by reading papers, by reading even Wikipedia, and by doing research, you find problems that are unanswered and you can explore them even as a middle school or a high school student, you don't need to be a professor. Um, and I, I want to add to that actually with something I learned from my mentor and one of the first things he told me which was kind of eye-opening with the time was that um, rather than focus on you know the method you want to apply or you know say you, you hear all this stuff about machine learning and you think it's really cool and now all of a sudden you want to do that focus on a problem so f whether it be a disease or an environmental problem or whatnot and then once you find a problem that you want to solve then you can use your passion for, and your drive for solving that problem to then think, then think about, you, you go into the, and think about everything you want to do, everything, all the possible ways you can think about solving that problem, and then naturally that's how, the, that's how you'll be able to innovate as long as you kind of have that drive to pursue a problem you're passionate about, and that comes first, I think, rather than trying to find the most complicated or what you think is the most novel method. And we will take one more question. Yes. I'm just curious, as a mom, uh, when you guys were really in the middle of doing your research, were you able to do other activities at Hartford, like sports or music or games? Because I, um, I know all of you probably have multiple interests, but how realistic was it for you guys to do the other things besides your research? Uh, Andrew, Jim, could you maybe take <laughs> First, and then we'll have a few others. Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess um, for me, I feel that it was uh, very easy to do this at Harker because there are just so many opportunities available to us. And um, I think what's, um, I think for me, the way I went about doing it is um, I didn't really do any research in um, ninth grade school year. I was mainly focusing on exploring my interests in the other areas like debate or like Boy Scouts or piano. And then over the summer, um, I, I mean, I contacted a professor and decided that I'd work a bit remotely with him. And then I'd end up working in his lab for just two weeks over the summer. And that's kind of just to figure out whether or not I liked it. And for the rest of the summer, I did other stuff like outdoors, Boy Scouts. I had another two-week debate camp at um, Harvard, so things like that. And when I really realized that I was interested in research, um, in 10th grade, I kind of spent a lot of my um, after-school time working on it. 
but it's also um, that's I didn't really do as many other activities in tenth grade other than research because I found that I was really passionate about it. Um, and then in eleventh grade, um, so I, I before eleventh grade once again I had a lot more time over the school year because I kind of finished um, my entire research project over the summer. So I think that's like a key uh, approach that a lot of us might take is just do a project over the summer, devote like your whole summer to doing that project, and then that kind of leaves the whole school year open for pursuing other interests. Yeah, I think as long as you are able to like get a good portion of it done over the summer, it's not that hard to juggle because research is really something you can find your own time. Like even if you're working at Harker, it as long as you're not like overburdened with other activities, it should be easy to uh, find a good balance of research and whatever else you want to pursue. So remember that when you love something, it's not work. So time has this magical way of sorting itself according to what your interests are. And so when you really get into research, I have to tell you that you know, you'll know you find that you've spent lots of hours in the lab, lots of hours doing something that uh, might not be schoolwork, but you, know, you don't think about it too much. You become so much more efficient when you do something you love. And that's what I encourage all of you to find. Find your passion, because that actually solves a lot of the problems here. When you really want to do something, it's not a chore. It's something that you make time for unconsciously. And you get a lot faster, you get a lot more better better work done when you're in that environment, so. Well, I can't think of any other way to end the 10th Research Symposium than with that. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, students. Thank you, parents, for attending.